Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. For more than 2,000 years, he's been doing all that he promised. Today, his church remains an assembly of his saints, providing a place for worship, fellowship, and instruction. In a world that often feels isolated and alone, church remains a place to connect. It's a place to call home. We're so glad you've chosen to connect with the family of believers at Campus Church in the Crown Center at Pensacola Christian College, as together we rejoice in the Lord. Take your Bible, if you would, and join me today in Psalm 107, Psalm 107. Have you ever lost something before and then not realized how special it was to you until it was lost and then when it was found, there was some meaningful rejoicing. In fact, more meaningful than had you never lost it in the first place. It's just the nature of having something and then having it removed and then having it restored. Your rejoicing is different than had you never have lost it. Now, oftentimes that's a thing, but when I was recounting what have I lost and then found again, an, an event happened in my life when I was about 10 years old and it wasn't this massive long standing. It was just a, a almost momentary event, but it made quite an impact on me. I couldn't have been over 10 years of age and mom and dad had sent all of us kids to bed. I'm the oldest of four kids. We're all three years apart, so... So I was 10, and so, you know, I had two younger brothers. My sister, Nikki, would have been maybe a year old. And dad and mom had sent us all to bed. I don't remember why, but you know how 10-year-olds find an excuse to get out of bed and go ask dad and mom a question. So it was probably 10, 10.30, maybe 11 o'clock, I don't know. But I got out of bed, and I called downstairs. A dad? A dad? Hey, dad, mom, no answer. So normally I anticipated hearing go to bed, okay? But hey, dad, nothing. So I go downstairs and, and uh, hey, dad, mom, no dad and mom. Now in, in our old Michigan house, there was an old basement. So, you know, I mean, I don't want to go down in the basement at 1030 at night. There are there are scary things that live down there, you know, so. Hey, Dad, a mom? I mean, you flip the lights on and I look. Nobody's in the basement. I look out in the backyard. Maybe they're sitting in the backyard. Nobody's in the backyard. I go upstairs to their room. Dad, Mom, nobody is there. I mean, my dad and mom are not. We had an old front porch on Michigan Ave in the place I grew up on. And so, so maybe they're sitting on the front porch. Dad, mom, nobody. My dad and mom are gone. And I, and I am a little bit panicked right now because dad and mom are nowhere to be found. And in my 10-year-old mind, I thought, I don't know what happened. The rapture. Why am I still here? You know, and, and then I go check the other kids. Like if the other kids were gone, I'm going to be in serious anxiety mode, okay? But all the other kids are there and like, what am I going to do? I'm the oldest. My dad and mom are gone. I wake up all the kids. Terry, Rob, get up. We, we, we're, we're going to the neighbors, okay? I knew if the rapture happened, our neighbors were still there. So we're going <laughs> to, we're going to the neighbors, okay? So. I get Nikki, the little one-year-old. I, I have Nikki, I have Terry, Rob, and we're, we're going, come on, we're going to the neighbors. And we're outside, we're walking across the street to the neighbors. And I hear this, hey, what? It's my dad and mom, they're walking down the street. I'm like, you know, tears well up in my eyes. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, you were gone, I'm going to the neighbors. I thought the rabbit, I don't know, you know what I'm and my, my mom and dad are like, oh, we're, we just went for a little walk right, right out in front of the house. Now, can you imagine if we would have made it to the neighbors, dad and mom come home and there's no kids. The rapture happened, you know. <laughs> now, I will tell you, I wasn't as thankful for my parents when they sent me to bed. But man, when I saw them walking down the street, 
what was lost, even albeit temporarily, had been found. The, the relief of even that momentary loss, I still remember today, it was quite meaningful. There seems to be something very special, significant, about having restored to you, having found what was lost. In Luke chapter 15, we, we get that theme repeated to us. There was a shepherd with a hundred sheep. Only one was lost, but he, he left the 99 in search of the one. And when he found the one that was lost, when the lost was found, he, he calls for his friends and his neighbors and he says, rejoice with me. The, the lost is now found. And then further we read, there was a, a lady who had lost a coin, a silver coin. She'd lost one. And so she goes in search of the one. And when she finds the one, she is so overjoyed that what was lost was found. What she had been separated from had been restored. And she is saying, hey, I'm going to call my friends. I'm going to call the neighbors. Let's have a celebration because what was lost is found. And then, of course, he goes into there was a man with two sons. And one said, father, give me. And he took of his inheritance. He went into a far country. He wasted it in riotous living. And then when he returns, the father says, put a ring on his finger, put shoes on his feet, put a robe on his back and kill the fatted calf because that which was lost is now found. Seems to be a, a recur recurring theme throughout scripture. Something really significant about having something that, that we once had that was lost and then is found. Of course, the title of the message today is Lost, and found. The Bible that you have open right now is turned to Psalm 107. Look at the beginning of this psalm, and it really is a lost and found psalm, but he begins with this, this um, overflow of praise. Verse number one and into two. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Not just that he does good, he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he hath redeemed, he brought back, he restored, he returned. Whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. The, that little expression, the hand of the enemy. It means from the power. Some say it's literally the clutch, the vice grip of the enemy. There was one who didn't belong there but was taken captive by the enemy. Now he's in the enemy's possession. And the Bible says, give thanks to the Lord because he has returned something. You had lost something that God now went to great measures to restore. A little background for the Psalm that we're about to look at. And we can't dive deep into this background, but it certainly would make a great study for any who are interested in. Many believe that Psalm 107 is written when Israel is returning from Babylonian captivity. And, and certainly the psalm fits very distinctly. That they had been held captive because of their disobedience. Their freedom lost. Their future dismal. But all oh, the joy when that which was lost is now returned. They found something that they once had, but had been removed from them. Uh, Cyrus is the king and they had served their 70 years captivity. And now God is going to, under the hand of a heathen king, he's going to, to tell this heathen king, send him back again to Jerusalem. This is unprecedented. It's unheard of. Nobody does this. Why would a guy like Cyrus send the Jews back to the nation that he has conquered that is no longer a nation to reestablish their national identity? And why would King Cyrus be the one who would actually finance the trip, secure their safety, and then pay for the beginnings of the restoration of the temple and its worship? Why would he do that? 
Well, simply because God told him to. Do you know Isaiah prophesied of Cyrus by name 220 years before the time of Cyrus? Who does that? God does that. Do you know what Isaiah prophesied? Isaiah chapter 44, verse number 28 says, that Seth of Cyrus, God Seth of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Who does this? God told Cyrus, send the people back. And Psalm 107 begins to detail, what's it like, Israel, to have something lost and then found? We're going to see detailed for us throughout Psalm 107, four very specific groups. And they have this incredible find They now have this wonderful reason to offer their praise to the Lord. And each of these causes for praise have to do with those who had lost something which God quite mercifully restored. The first group that we're going to see here is what we'll call the wanderer. The wanderer. In all four of these groups, we see this pattern that's about to unfold. We're going to see it with the wanderer. And that is they have this predicament. Like, oh, wow, you guys got yourself into some hot water, the predicament. And then there's a petition. They see their circumstances. They're going to do something about it. They just cry out to God. This is their petition. And then we see the reason for the praise. And we see this pattern in all four instances detailed for us in Psalm 107. The, The wanderer had lost their way. They needed to find their way again. Notice the predicament that we see. It's Psalm 107, beginning in verse number two. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he hath redeemed from the hand, the clutch, the grip of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands. Listen, from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south. They, here they are, they wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in, no place that they could truly call home. Now, maybe you are here today and you can identify with the restlessness of the wanderer. You have no direction. You've lost your bearings. You struggle to identify your purpose. You feel a little bit lost. It's like, I don't even know, why am I here? What's my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing? I, I, I don't even know. You are like the wanderer. You haven't found your place. For this group, there is this unsettledness that seems to constantly afflict them. They're looking for that place that will finally resolve their wandering spirit. But, but might I add, it wasn't really the place that was going to be the answer for God's people. They had resided in the place before. Yet they went wandering after other gods, after other pleasures, after other satisfactions that were never truly satisfying. Even when they had their place, they were still wandering. Many keep wandering today. They go from one relationship to the next, from one job to the next, from one hobby to the next, one church to the next, from one thrill to the next, from one marriage to the next. They're wandering in search for something more fulfilling or more satisfying, but they're left still searching. Even believers often find that they're wandering in search of the next spiritual high, something that would equal or at least, you know, do something like similar to what they had previously experienced. At least something that would would match what they have created in their own mind regarding a spiritual experience. For some, this restlessness confronts them in connection to their purpose in life. They feel stuck and begin to wonder if they're accomplishing anything. Remember, our chief duty, the chief duty of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Do you know that means that wherever you are, 
whatever your occupation, whatever your station, whatever your age, whatever your stage, it really doesn't matter. Wherever God has you right now, you have the ability to fulfill your purpose in life by bringing glory to God, that other people see the light of Jesus Christ shine in you and your life gives other people the high opinion of your great God. Well, what do they do? These are the wanderers. What do they do? Well, we just go on to this pattern that we're going to see. They, they offer this petition. What is the petition? Psalm 107, verse number six. Then they, here it is, they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them out of their distresses. Isn't it amazing how oftentimes we try to resolve the challenge of our life without calling out to the one who actually has the answer? We wander from place to place, from circumstance to circumstance, relationship to relationship, thrill to thrill, and we keep coming up empty. What do they finally do? They understand the predicament they're in. They finally cry out to the one who has what they need. What's the one thing that you do if you're lost? You, you cry out for help. Have you ever been lost before? And I mean, actually lifted up your voice to cry out for help. The Bible helps us understand this again all throughout the word. Psalm 107, verse number six, they cried unto the Lord. What is it that they're doing? They're just saying, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him. I lifted up my voice to the one who had what I needed. And then we see what they do is, is that they, they, the natural response is they start to praise the Lord. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. God reestablished their way. He ceased their wandering. He returns them to the place of, oh God, you are the one that we left and now we have come back home to you. Have you lost your way? There is one who can help you find it again. L look at the next one. Not only do we see the wanderer, now we see what we'll call the captive. The captive, the captive had lost his freedom. This is a person who sat in darkness. He, he has the bars of the prison that have closed him in. He needs someone to come and loose the chains that have bound him. The word restless might be fitting for the first group, the wanderer. The word miserable is a description of the second. Notice their predicament. It's found beginning in verse number 10. Think about this group, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the most high. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. He's saying, okay, listen, Here's what you did, and now here's what you're going to suffer. And I'm going to let you experience the natural consequence of your own poor choices. The predicament, these are the captive, they are the bound. And notice that this person is sitting in absolute darkness. It appears they're even awaiting imminent death. Why? Because they made choices to sit there. They hated, the Bible says, the counsel of the Lord. And today there are many that are sitting in a dungeon of their own making. They craft their own cell. They forge the chains themselves. They secure the locks. And then to make matters worse, they blow out the candle in their own dungeon. All this they do themselves and then lament the prison which held them captive. To what lengths should anyone go to remove them from the prison of their own making? The grand lie of the deceiver is this. There's no hope. We start to realize this is the prison that I crafted. Th these are the bars that I made. These are the chains that I forged. The, the light, I'm the one who blew out the candle that had any flicker of hope. And the lie of the deceiver is, yeah, you're exactly right. For you, there is no hope. And that's what he continually whispers in our ear. He says, listen, this is nobody's fault but your own. So deal with it. 
there's none to help. Aren't you thankful that that is not the way that your merciful God looks at you? That your gracious, merciful God does allow us to sit in a dungeon of our own making, but only until we finally come to the place where we again make our petition. Look at the petition, verse number 13. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands in sunder. The, the very things that they had forged, God gives them freedom. Why does he do this? Because God is good, not just because he does good, he has promised to hear your cry. Psalm chapter 10, verse number 17, Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear. He hears the desire. Like I didn't even whisper this, Lord, this is just my heart's desire. And then he says, I'm gonna bend my ear. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come and I'm gonna listen carefully for just the whisper of your cry. But what does he do? He hears the cry of the captive. And then how do they respond? The, the praise. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Are you held captive by something and sitting in a darkened prison of your own making? Do you need to be delivered there is one who is ready to set you free. L look at this third group. The third group we'll refer to as the afflicted. The afflicted. We see the wanderer, we see the captive, and now we see the afflicted. So far, we have understood these are some products of their own making, as is the case with this. The afflicted had lost their health. They needed to be healed. Notice the predicament. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. We all know what happens to our appetite when we are ill. Sometimes it's even difficult to think about taking nourishment. Because there's something wrong. There's something that is not healthy about our body and it refuses, rejects, oftentimes the very thing necessary to regain strength. Many of you may have sat beside the bedside of someone severely ill, even approaching death. And one of the characteristics, again, so common is they will not take nourishment. At times there are those whose spiritual languishing causes them to resist the very thing that can offer them health, restoration, new strength. So they continue on in depression and frustration and a general state of spiritual sickness. It's what marks their days. Again, that which offers them health, they turn their face from and resist. What is God waiting for? He's, he's simply waiting for them to cry out to him. Once again, to offer that petition. And the Bible says again in verse number 19, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word and, aren't these good words, healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Now, is this fair? Again, the Bible says when we looked earlier, fools because of their transgression, because of their iniquities are afflicted. Okay, we get that. Hey, hey, you acted foolishly and now you're gonna suffer your own afflictions. You're, you're living, so to speak, sleeping in a bed of your own making. Is that fair? How many of you, does it bother you? You're standing in the, the Starbucks line and it's gonna be 20 minutes to get through the line. And someone way in front of you, you know, they see their friend walk in the door and they say, oh, hey, come here. Come on. No, you can, you can stand up here. And they turn around. It's okay. It's okay. And you're like, no, it's not okay. All right. But how many of you, if you were the friend walking in the door and you had a friend up front and they said, hey, come here, come here, come here. How many of you, it's okay then? Okay. It's different, isn't it? 
There's something about fairness that offends us when someone else is treated in a way that's not fair. But there's something rather permissive when we're the person being excused in a not fair situation. Do you know God is not to be praised for his fairness? Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his fairness. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. Do you know what God is waiting for, for this person who is in poor spiritual health? That there's nothing sound about them and it's a product of their own making. Do you know what God's waiting for? Simply for their cry. Lord, I made a mess of this. I'm calling out to you. And then what is the petition? He just says, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. What is the praise? Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men and let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. Maybe you are among the afflicted. You've lost some spiritual health. There is a great physician who has a prescription for your restoration. What you have lost spiritually can again be found. We've seen the restless. We've seen the miserable. We've seen the afflicted. Now, as we conclude, let's look at the toss. These are those that are reeling from difficult circumstances, but this group is different from the previous three. The tossed. There was, there was some wandering that was taking place. Well, they were wandering because of their own problem, their own sin. They had no habitation because of their own choices. There were those that were captive. Yeah, they constructed the prison cell. They forged their own chains. There were those who were afflicted. Yeah, this was again because of their own foolish choices. And God heard the cry of all three. But this one is, is different. These are they that are tossed. And not because of a foolish choice. They didn't bring about this tumult in their life. It's just the result of the circumstances upon which they are thrust. Notice what the Bible says regarding their predicament. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do, great business, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man. And are at their wits end. These are reeling from their circumstances. They need to regain stability. They've lost their equilibrium. And interestingly enough, it is of no fault of their own. Again, it's unique from the first three. The first three, the result of their own making. But this is different. There appears to be no cause for this challenge, this predicament. These were not the troubles of their own making. They're simply the circumstances that were handed to them. And not only were the circumstances beyond their making, they were beyond their fixing. They didn't cause the trouble and they couldn't fix it either. Many times God causes our world to begin to collapse. Where are you right now? Are you a little bewildered regarding the circumstances of your life? Like, God, I, I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm asking all the questions. Did I do something? God, is it because of my own foolishness? Am, am I the one who forged the chains? Am, am I the one who invited the difficulty? Am I the one who rejected the nourishment? Am I the problem? We keep coming up to a loss. Lord, I, I don't know why. Lord, I'm not perfect and I know it. I acknowledge it, but God, why am I facing these circumstances today? I've lost my balance. I, I'm, like a, I'm like a person who, who's intoxicated. I stumble about. I, I have no stability, no sure standing. My, my footing is taken out from under me. God, why is this happening? And that's a good question to ask. 
And I don't presume to offer to you all the reasons as to the why. But but here are a couple in brief. Why does God allow us to be tossed in this sea of turmoil? Maybe just to get our attention. To get our attention. We've started to stray just slightly. Why does God allow us to be tossed? Sometimes to give us new direction. To give us new direction. We thought we were just on the course. This is life. This is how I'm doing life. And and this is how I've always done life. And this is where I am. And I'm really comfortable. And I'm secure. And I know how everything works. And God says, hey, I'm going to shake things up just a little bit. And God says, I'm going to give you a new direction in life. So he he stirs things up. We're tossed about a little bit. We lost our footing and and to regain it, Lord, what do you want me to be doing? He has our attention, gives us some new direction. Maybe it's simply because he wants to communicate to us his affection. You say, well, to toss me about, listen, isn't God sweeter to you in the midst of the challenge than he was prior Don't you find his mercies more present, his love more deep? Don't you find the reality of him more clear when you're going through times of difficulty, when you feel tossed about by the wind and and just all thrown around? Listen, when Peter gets out of the boat and he steps his foot on the water and he begins to walk with Jesus, don't you think that even though he begins to sink, there's something forever for the apostle Peter that was wonderfully sweet when Jesus himself took his hand and they two together walk on the water and they now are finding the security of the boat. Why is it that God allows sometimes our our life to be tossed about? Maybe he just wants to communicate to you his affection. Maybe it is simply to bring about our, what we'll call perfection, perfection. By that, I don't mean our sinlessness, but I do mean by that what scripture oftentimes communicates, and that is our completion. That the man of God may be perfect, not sinless. That the man of God may be complete. That you can have what you need to face the challenges of the day. Do you know, God understands what your tomorrow is going to look like. And sometimes he may send you through a bit of a tumult, through some tossed waves that they they rise and they fall and they crash. And it's like, Lord, I'm having a hard time getting my footing. And sometimes God may do that because he's trying to bring about some strength, some ability to navigate the challenges of life because he knows what your tomorrow is. He's bringing about completion. Notice the petition for this group that are tossed. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he bringeth them out of their distresses. The word distresses there is a good word. It means narrow or straightness. It means that they're tossed about. It means like the world seems to be closing in on me. I feel this pressure on every side. And and God says he delivered them from that narrowness. He gave them some room to breathe. What's the praise? He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them into their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness for his wonderful works to the children of men. You may be experiencing turbulence of circumstances that are not of your own making. You're tossed, you're thrown about in some of the most fearful of circumstances. Your duty is the same as those who are struggling with troubles of their own making. And that is cry out to the one who desires to bring you into that haven of rest. And then what is our duty, regardless of why we have lost something? Once it is found, our duty is to praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. King David had lost something. He lost the joy that comes with salvation. So he simply made a petition. It was simple, it was straightforward, and it went like this. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. 
restore. It means return to me what was lost. The words free spirit, it means that God is willing to do so. The wanderer, the captive, the afflicted, the tossed. In each of these situations, the answer is found in the petition. And whether the problem was one of their own making or circumstances, they had nothing to do with. God was their answer. It meant calling out to him. So let me ask you today, have you lost something? There is something truly special about finding it again. And the only one who can restore what you have lost is God. And he's ready to do the work of restoration. Then do you know what you will do when God returns what you've lost? You will with an increased knowledge of I have something good that I may not have fully appreciated when I had it. Oh God, I have something good and I will praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus, this is Rejoice in the Lord.